Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to our talk on fuzzing the CNCF's landscape. My name is Adam, and uh, I work with David at Ada Logics. And over the course of the almost la of the last almost two years, we have been working on securing and imp we have been working on improving the security posture of CNCF projects by way of fuzzing. Uh, the work has been uh, funded by um, the CNCF, and in this talk we will present some of the experiences and the results that have come out of this, and we will um, look forward uh, and consider where we are in the greater picture of, uh, of this work. A quick uh, run-through of uh, what we will go through in this talk. Um, uh, a quick uh, fuzzing intro for those that are unfamiliar with fuzzing. Um, next, we will go through the OSS Fuzz project and why it is so important for the open source uh, ecosystem. Then we will touch upon and go into uh, the state of fuzzing CNCF projects. And uh, in that regard, we will um, go into how we how to fuzz a CNCF project and how we approach uh, that uh, challenge, um, and some of the results that have come out of this. And lastly, we will consider future work uh, in terms of um, in the perspective of where we what the work that has been done now and where we will be going next. And uh, hello, hello. And also just to note here, uh, we'll present a lot of work that we have been doing, but we will also touch upon projects and data where we are just like tiny pieces of, of the whole puzzle because there are other people fussing uh, various CNCF projects and uh, they deserve a huge amount of credit in the data that we show as well. Okay, so I'm David and I'm gonna give a quick intro to fussing. And the main reason for this is uh, amongst other reasons, to kind of argue why it's useful to people who might be interested in fuzzing but, not, but, but might not believe it's, it's really working. And um, how many here are familiar with fuzzing? How many have uh, heard about it before? Okay, so around, I wanna say 40% or something? How many have never heard about fuzzing before? Okay, so certainly, I think maybe this talk is jumping a little bit too, too ahead then. Uh, so. So fuzzing from a high point of view is like automating test case generation. So it's very similar to writing test unit tests or integration tests, but it's a way to kind of like generalize the input that a test case uh, uses. So on the left here, you see traditional ways of, of, of testing, uh, let's say my API. And if you were to test that with various different inputs, you would just have, you know, a set of uh, lines in your code that says that calls my API with, with the, the different inputs. And the way you would generalize this in fuzzing is you would have this essentially a loop that calls into my API, but instead of giving a specific input, you would just ask the fuzzer to give you this input. Like give, you would ask the fuzzer to give you some input, and that will then kind of like, uh, the point is then that the fuzzer can generate all sorts of inputs. And this is um, the input that the fuzzer will generate is often considered to be just random input. But in fact, it's kind of input that has uh, been constructed by way of a very complex system underneath that is the fuzzing engine, which approximates, in a sense, a, a very useful input for, for, for the fuzzer, if one can argue. But how this will look in actual code is right there. So here we have the simplest case of a, um, fuzz driver in the Go language, where you just have a function called fuzz, and this will then be called by the fuzzing engine, which is kind of like underlying in your program, with the fuzzer input. And then you just call my API. So this is the exact way that you would um, write a fuzzer for my API in Golang. So as I said before, there's this, when, there's this myth that fuzzing is just random input. It's not gonna work to my application that uses highly complex data, data types. And this is, uh, uh, is kind of like a response we often hear when we approach CNCF projects, especially CNCF projects that are not 
that are written in memory safe languages. So in memory unsafe languages, C and C++, fuzzing has been around for, for quite a number of year now, years now. I think uh, fuzzing was first started around 30 years ago, but it has really had this evolution or, or resurgence in a sense the last 15 years or so, where this coverage guided fuzzing came to be. Uh, so we often get this response when we say we would like to fuzz your project. We often get a, a, a very sort of critical view from us. It's not gonna work because it's just random testing. And it's just a false notion in a sense. Um, there are hundreds of academic papers in the last decade exploring how to improve fuzzing. And it did start 30 years ago with basically just catting from random and using that as input to your program. But that's not how it is anymore. It's uh, highly structured tools that try to pick the right inputs to your code such that you will execute essentially uh, as much of the underlying code as possible. And when I say modern day fuzzes here, I really refer to coverage guided fuzzes. So the sort of like underlying principles in coverage guided fuzzing is that you have a given corpus, which is just a set of test cases and these are the test cases that you work from when you want to generate new input to a, 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 an API. And the fuzzer will start with a given corpus. It could be just a, a random element. And then it will start to execute, and then you will have to compile your code. So your target project that you want to analyze, you have to compile that in a certain way such that essentially the compiler can insert extra code into your program that the fuzzer will use to essentially trace execution in the target. And it's then going to use this I, I, ability to track execution in the program to identify whether a given test case is good or bad. And the way it's going to do this is it's going to uh, pick Cs from the, from the corpus. It will execute the program with that seed, and then it will track what was the kind of like, let's just, let's just call it execution path of that program, okay? Then it will save the execution path into kind of like a set of, we have explored this already. Then the next time, it will so like just run again, pick a new seed from the corpus, mutate that seed, so that means just modify it randomly in a sense, and then it will execute the program again, and again trace, did, did we see a new trace in the program? It's not really traces, but it's, I think it's more intuitive to think of it that way. And if there is a new coverage, say a new trace with this new input, then it will save the, that seed into the corpus. But if, if there isn't new coverage, then it will just kind of like forget about that seed. And the main point is that you build up this corpus iteratively where each seed in the, in the corpus essentially executes the target program in a unique way. And the benefit of this is that you will reduce the complexity for uh, to like exploring the code. And I'm going to try to argue that through a small example here. So say for example you have a program that checks, that has four conditions that checks a byte in each, like in a given uh, data buffer. And if you were to guess four, uh, four bytes correctly, say uh, A, B, C, D, just four characters, you would have a, 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 an input space of two to the 32. Because a byte is eight bits, and four bytes is thus 32 bits, which is two to 32. But because we have this notion of corpus and coverage guided, we have to guess each byte essentially one at a time. And when we are to guess one byte, there's two to the eighth chances of getting it correctly, okay? So that's one, uh, that's, you have a, a chance of one out of 256 to guess the first byte correctly. So let's say we get the first byte correctly, then we save that seed in our corpus and we just call our current seed, so like a data buffer with A. And then we have to guess the next one. And that's again, to guess the next byte, we again have a chance of one of two to 56 of guessing it correctly. And that kind of keeps going until we have guessed A, B, C, D correctly. And again, the reason we do that is because we save, whenever we see that we guessed it correctly, we save that and we move on to guess the next byte. So the point is that we have, uh, we have to guess a maximum 256 times four times, which is 1,024, which is much less than 2 to 32. 
And that's kind of the ideas behind coverage guided fuzzing and why it reduces the complexity of exploring a program from just random guessing. And this is, uh, this, this thing is called coverage guided fuzzing. And that's kind of like one of the breakthroughs in fuzzing that essentially made it much more ap applicable and uh, what almost everybody uses today. Okay, so which box can you uncover with fuzzing? Fundamentally, fuzzers are just test case generators. They explore the code. They don't actually detect the box. The thing that detects the box is just what, how the program executes. And we then have this concept of sanitizers in memory safe languages. And these sanitizers are essentially kind of like box oracles that you compile into your code, which can check for things such as uh, buffer overflows, uh, valid, invalid dereferences, and use after freeze, and all these kind of things, which are common things in, in, in memory, safe, uh, memory unsafe languages. In memory safe languages, which is what most of the CNCF projects are written in, in particular Go, you will, you will be finding, you, you essentially don't have sanitizers. So the things that you find at the moment are stuff such as uncored, uncored exceptions, out of bounds, nil pointed references, timeouts, in some sense deadlocks, and out of memory issues. And these are kind of the things you can expect when you fuss, uh, when you fuss a, 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 a Golang uh, project. You can also do various things such as behavioral testing, but I don't think I will go into that now. Um, but point being, uh, you can expect, you, the fussers will not detect an issue in itself. It's actually when the pro, you will just explore the program the various ways it executes, and then potentially you will find that if you execute it this way, it will throw a nil point at the reference. Okay. So fuzzers are pretty complex to, to, to manage. Uh, as I said, we need to have this corpus, and we, the fuzzer will build up the corpus over time as it explores the code, and that also means you shouldn't run the fuzzer from an empty corpus whenever you run it. You kind of have to incrementally build it up over like each day, over the years, and so on. And there's also a lot of other issues that comes with managing fuzzers, such as uh, you know, how do you keep track of all the bugs, how do you report things, and how do you share results between everybody? And this is what we have OSSFOS for. So OSSFOS is a service run by Google, which is uh, OSS, I think it's open source software. software fuzzing, thank you. And it's essentially a Git repository where you upload um, a Docker file, you upload a build script, and then you, to a given folder in this GitHub repository, and then Google will just start running all the fuzzers that the given build script will build. So this is where the vast majority of open source projects are being fussed by way of now. And I think that uh, OSSFuzz has around 600 open source projects, so essentially all the, the, the very security critical ones. And all the ones that we will be talking about in this case, in, in this talk, is also on OSSFuzz. And yeah, we have a link here to how to integrate into OSSFuzz. Um, please check it out. OSSFuzz might be a little bit large, because there's a, it's just, it's just in a sense, a big, big framework that, that lies on the, underneath it. And some maintainers are actually not that interested in getting to OSSFuzz because they feel it's a little bit too heavy. The same developers of OSSFuzz has developed this concept called ClusterFuzz Lite, which essentially runs and manages all of your fuzzes in your CI. And you don't have to, um, to like do the whole in integration into OSSFuzz. And ClusterFuzz Lite is also uh, straightforward to integrate into your project. So if you are an open source maintainer or similar, check it out. Okay, so uh, I think I've already talked about this. Uh, let's now talk about the CNCF landscape being fast. Over to Adam. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so here we see an overview of the CNCF projects that are currently integrated into OSS Fuzz. And um, uh, quick uh, note, Istio will also fall in, on this list uh, once it uh, joins. Uh, at Alogix, we have uh, written a lot of fuzzers for Istio, which also has uh, resulted in a high severity finding. Uh, we have a blog post about that on our blog. Uh, it's a pretty interesting case if you are a Go developer, uh, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, there might be a CNCF uh, project, at least I can think of at least one that do have fossas and do a pretty good job at writing fossas uh, and maintaining them and uh, making sure that they are not broken. But uh, not all CNCF projects that do um, maintain a fuzzing suite are int integrated into OSS fuzz. And because of that, it's, it's, 
it's a little um, difficult to say that that, they, that these projects are running their fossils correctly uh, for the reasons that David um, mentioned, because running the fossils, especially once you get, uh, start having 10, 20, 30 fossils in your system, in your project, um, it becomes a very complex task to run these fossils. So if you can think of a project here that uh, do a good job at uh, maintaining a fossil suite, but it's not on this list, that is the reason. Uh, and if you are such a project, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to integrate your project into a CESFOS for you. So let's talk about uh, how to force a CNCF project. And this is uh, the, the approach that we take. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, that, that is our practical uh, approach uh, to pretty much all CNCF projects that we approach that uh, have done no prior work uh, with fossing. Uh, David mentioned we have worked on some projects that have worked on fossing for years um, and uh, that, um, th that is another story. So, so, so this is more in terms of uh, taking a project from zero to having a pretty solid fossing setup. So we start with an in initial integration and uh, to us that means um, we start by writing a few initial fossils uh, and merge them into the CNCF fossing repository where we maintain all fossils that we write um, for, for the CNCF projects. Um, we, are, we are open for contributions there, and uh, please check it out if, if, you, if, you, if you wish to. Next, we uh, integrate the project into OSS FOSS, so the fossils run continuously. And on, in the OSS FOSS integration, we instruct um, OSS FOSS to pull the latest master branch or release branch, and pull the fossils from the CNCF fossing repository so that, um, so that we can work uh, on the fossils through the CNCF fossing repository and OSSFOS will catch those updates uh, continuously. Uh, the next step is we write a lot of fossils to, to get coverage up and uh, um, yeah, I mean at, at this point we, we, uh, we have made the initial integration and uh, we, we, the, the next step is really to increase coverage of the whole project, starting with complex uh, uh, parts of the code base. Finally, we, uh, we work on delivering this over to the project maintainers and owners. And if we, the goal on this final step is to make the owners take charge of the, the process, uh, the project owners take charge of uh, the fussing from here. We want, the, it, it is our goal that it is the projects, um, it is the projects uh, uh, that, that, that they take complete ownership and they can do whatever they want, delete fossils, modify fossils if, if they, if, if they see, see it fit. Um, and, and in this f uh, step here, step three, we uh, work with the projects on doing that. So there are some pros and cons of having someone like OSA Data Logics integrate a CNCF project uh, integrate fussing into a CNCF project. And one of, one of uh, the pros is that we have a lot of uh, experience with fussing. Uh, I think at Adalogix we have contributed fossils to more than 200 open source uh, security projects, uh, sorry, open source projects. Um, so, and we have, you know, gone down rabbit holes. We have seen what, uh, you know, what, how, how to quickly get, get from zero to, to one um, and effectively. Uh, but of course, we don't have the year, months and years of experience that the, the project maintainers do. Um, and uh, yeah, naturally, um, the, on the third one as well, maintainers don't have um, that much time to first uh, you, you know, learn about fuzzing and uh, how to uh, best integrate it into their project. Um, they have plenty to do already. Um, I believe we had a project where they had had, had, had a Git, GitHub issue uh, on um, the fact that they should integrate fuzzing into that project for two years. This this issue had been open, and um, at Adalogix we were we were able to pretty quickly uh, get fuzzing started, and the, um, the the engagement resulted in a high severity CVE. Um, so yeah. Um, I think that's it for this one. Uh, yeah, so, so in, in terms of uh, the last step in the process of integrating, of uh, working with the CNCF projects, 
uh, a few things that we do uh, when, we, when we wish to hand over the fuzzing suite to the projects themselves is that we encourage, so uh, we, we work from the CNCF, CNCF fuzzing repo uh, initially, and we encourage the maintainers to move the fuzzers upstream to um, uh, integrate it into the uh, test suite, CI, um, nightly builds, et, et cetera, um, and um, which will make uh, maintenance uh, easier and uh, should uh, help the projects avoid downtime uh, in, their, in their fuzzers. Um, there, there will often be a, a, a list of bugs uh, found in, in this uh, engagement and um, OSS Boss has capabilities to reproduce these very easily and uh, this, this, uh, this will um, be something that will help projects with. Uh, we encourage uh, projects to write uh, fossils uh, specific for their target uh, uh, project um, and simply, simply uh, further develop the whole uh, fuzzing setup, uh, how, how the projects see fit. A quick note on, if, on uh, our GoFuzz header uh, project, if you are a, a project that, uh, is, that is implemented in Go, we have a very uh, neat little uh, library here that makes it uh, quite easy to fuzz structured uh, data types. Uh, you simply uh, in initiate a Fuzz consumer, where you, after which you can quickly create random uh, or pseudo random um, uh, versions of structs, maps, slices, and much more. So, uh, quick note on that if you wish to use that. Okay, so, hello, hello. All right, so um, you can fast a lot of different uh, projects written in a lot of different languages, and essentially, OSS for supports all. Uh, supports projects written in Golang, C and C++, Rust, Python, and Java. Java. And the bugs you look for in various, uh, the bugs you look for in a project kind of depends on the language that you are uh, uh, fussing. And threat models of the projects that you are fussing may not always be present. So you can go multiple ways when you are to, say, fuss a project. You can either try to like, extrapolate from the testing suite that they have. You can, you can try to identify the whole, and the result of that is that you will find most likely a lot of bugs, but may not be security relevant bugs, because you might not so like, attack the threat model in a sense. Um, and CCF projects are often written in memory safe languages, which means that if you are looking to fuss CCF projects, most likely you will turn into Go or say mainly Go to be honest. But at the same time, even if you are fussing a, a project written in Golang, you can always look for the, the dependencies of a given project. So for example, Flux, it's a GitOps tool that is based on, that is written in Go, and it's a, it's like a bunch of custom Kubernetes operators, controllers, sorry. And that depends, Flux depends on the other Go project called Git2Go, and Git2Go itself depends on a library called libgit, which has 60,000 lines of C, of C or C++ code, I can't remember. Which essentially means, even if you are just interested in fussing memory unsafe projects, you can still go for a lot of, um, say, CNCF projects that may not be written in uh, memory unsafe languages, because they will have dependencies to memory unsafe languages. Okay, so what are the results here? And the results we are going to present in this section uh, is essentially uh, the data given to us by OSSFOS on this URL. So they make all of the results publicly available by, uh, on box.chromium.org. And you can use the following query to uh, essentially get the results that, 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 that we're going to show. And I want to just give a note here that this is an over approximation from the perspective of the results are the results, but it will be, the fuzzers will, so like, not necessarily only find legit bugs. The fuzzers themselves can have issues which will be reported as a bug in this manner. The engines can sometimes have an issue which will also report a bug. So take it with a little bit of grain of salt and don't expect that all these numbers constitute exploitable bugs. So these are the results on, uh, from, from OSS first reported. And potentially what we can see here is that there are two projects, Envoy and Fluentbit written in C++ and C, and they have approximately, uh, well, above 200 bucks each reported. And notice again that this, is, this does include security bucks and also non-security bucks as set by OSS first. So if you look at the query, you can see I have this like, type here, 
where we both include security and box security types. So it's not just security types. And this includes all forms of, uh, well, all forms of memory corruption issues that you can imagine. And notice here that uh, Envoy has been fussing for, I think they first integrated into to OSS first since 2016. And I believe that the team has done like a tremendous job in, in, in getting fussing all over their project. So in the sense that there's a lot of box, it's a good sign from the perspective of they have analyzed a lot of their code base. We don't have all of the, the Golang projects here, and you can see that the numbers are uh, uh, quite a bit lower, but this is also a reference to they are not as like, mature in their fussing approach as uh, the two other projects that I mentioned here. But these are the numbers that you can expect, and uh, in a sense it also goes to show there is some, there will be work involved here, because imagine sitting at the receiving end of Envoy and you have to analyze 860 bucks to verify how to fix them or, or et cetera, et cetera. A lot of them will also be so like issues from the OSS for side that will be fixed by itself in a sense, um, but there will be a lot of work for, for, for the developers to, to, to deal with this stuff. So if we were to plot the issues that are reported here, we can plot them based on how many issues are, are closed on this uh, monorail, so the database that I've just shown, or, and also how many are open. And in that sense, we can see how often box so like get introduced or like get found by the fusses and how often they are so like fixed. So here we have a project called Argo and uh, the red graph that you see up here is the amount of box closed on the database. That means whenever a, a bug is fixed, it will turn from open to closed. So closed is just gonna go upwards depending on how many bugs gets found and fixed. Whereas the blue one, the blue uh, so like line shows how many issues are open. So ideally it will go a little bit up and then it will hopefully go down depending on how fast the bugs are fixed. And here we have an example of say, uh, when fuzzing was introduced, quickly a lot of bugs was found, but they were also very, very fast to fix it. And we can also see that it's kind of a logarithmic uh, curve, the red one, which means that the fuzzers will find a lot of bugs in the beginning and then it will start to fade out as they kind of have explored all of their potential or get to explore all of their potential. We have another project here, Kubernetes, and notice that the, the, so the x-axis shows the date and the y-axis shows the, uh, the amount of issues, closed or, or opened. And here you can see, so like a, a similar graph, it logarithmic in a sense, and there are a few bugs still open in the Kubernetes uh, bug tracker. We then have an example of LinkedIn 2 proxy, where you can see that, again, the red graph will have a logarithmic sign, but also a logarithmic curve. But you can also see that they are very fast at fixing the bugs. Whenever bugs occur, the next day it's fixed. So it's kind of like a great, uh, they, they, they do it really well, the Liga D team. But at the same time, you can also see bugs kind of stopped being found, let's say uh, six months ago, and you can ask why. Most likely that's because they don't contribute new fusses to their code base, which is also an interesting uh, uh, thought. So if you were to, for example, if you knew how to fuss Rust projects, most likely you could go and, 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 and help them out. Fluentbit, another just example, and again, we see it, it's like, they, so like the, the blue bar keeps being low, whereas the box keep increasing, and that's also a sign of whenever, uh, so like whenever a bug is found and fixed, that one gets put, you know, put on the red bar, but the blue one kind of stays constant, and that means every time a bug is fixed, a new one is found. So when, it, when your fuzzer finds a, finds a bug, it will kind of like run into that bug all the time. So it will kind of be detected all the time. When you then fix it, it can finally progress further in the coverage, and that's why kind of like the red will continue to grow, whereas the blue line stays stable. Um, and here's the Envoy project. Uh, yeah. Future work, give that to Adam. Yeah, so let's uh, talk about uh, where we'll go from here. Um, let's uh, zoom out a little bit in terms of uh, where we are in the greater scheme of things here. Uh, as David mentioned, um, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, a lot of work has been done in uh, making fuzzing generally available for, uh, uh, for open source projects, for the open source community. Um, that, that has included uh, writing really, really great uh, fuzzing engines, sanitizers, and uh, bringing these, um, this technology to, other to, to all sorts of languages, uh, as David already mentioned. Uh, so we have uh, quite uh, mature uh, fuzzing engines now, 
Uh, but of course, we are seeing changes in this as well. For example, with Go 118, where the fuzzing engine is uh, getting uh, integrated into the language itself. Uh, so next, over the, over the uh, last few years, we have worked on bringing these fuzzing capabilities to the CNCF projects. Um, and um, and, in, in, and like you see, that, that is like more or less where, where we are in, in, that, in that story. Uh, so let's talk about the next steps, what, what will happen over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, like we mentioned, we want to uh, see main maintainers involved. It will make a huge difference, for, difference for in terms of um, taking fuzzing from uh, the initial step to, uh, to, to really approaching it from a domain uh, specific uh, knowledge kind of uh, approach. Um, Next, we, we will see more bug box oracles and sanitizers for memory-safe languages. Um, there are a, a bunch of, of vulnerabilities that fossils don't detect. They, they do detect some, but there are a lot that they don't detect, and we want to find those automatically. Um, next, uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, in mat mature fossing uh, even more based on what has been done now. Um, and that involves involving, involving the community and the maintainers. Could I just, could I just interrupt here? Uh, so with regards to this, uh, can, could you go one back? With, with regards to this bug oracles uh, sanitizers, one important point to highlight here is that we have Java fuzzing available, but it didn't detect the log4j issue. Then they, the developers of this uh, Java fuzzing engine came up with a bug oracle to detect command injections, and they found uh, log4j in a matter of minutes with that, so like the new bug oracle. And you'll see a lot more of that where people will try to identify those type of like, high-level issues that may not be just detectable by the program crashing, for example. Yeah, so I, I, I guess we have already gone through the maintainer involvement. Um, that is one of the steps that we, will, uh, that we want to see over the next couple of years. Um, but yeah, so David had, a, had an example of a real-world uh, scenario uh, where a, a bug detector was improved to, to detect uh, new vulnerabilities. And um, let's, let's talk about how, like, uh, some possible scenarios where they, that will uh, occur in the, um, in the cloud-native space that, uh, that the CNCF projects can benefit from. So when we talk about uh, bug oracles or sanitizers, we, we consider it from, an, from a perspective of uh, it being integrated like into fuzzing where the, the developers of fuzz harnesses and t the tests itself don't have to tweak or uh, change settings of the fuzzers, but um, the same fuzz test can be used to detect all these different uh, uh, bugs and uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so for example, now in Go, as David mentioned, we, we detect, uh, we have uh, a, list, a series of bugs that, that we can detect uh, automatically, like out of ranges, out of memories, timeouts, nail the references, et cetera. Uh, but let's, let's it, it's very likely that we'll see a race condition uh, sanitizer, for example, that uh, will not only detect uh, possible uh, race conditions, but might also try to slow down a program in order to uh, win a race and pr uh, produce a, a complete reproducible test case. Uh, next, logging. We have a, a series of vulnerabilities associated with logging. Uh, for example, can, can users uh, input uh, arbitrary data um, into the logs and thus uh, create fake log entries uh, to, to prevent uh, an audit trail. Uh, file handling, uh, that seems that is a big issue also in the CNCF um, landscape. Um, I believe the, to the talk after hours is about uh, uh, a vulnerability associated to, um, to, to file handling, so I, I encourage you to check that out. But basically, can we read arbitrary files? Can we write uh, arbitrary files on the system uh, that we're not supposed to? Command injections, we, at Data Logics, we found a, a CVE, in, a high severity CVE, I believe, in uh, Flux uh, in last winter. And um, that, that con I think, believe they found another one just last week. Um, and yeah, the, it continues to be a, an issue in, in the, uh, in the memory-safe languages. And uh, we, it would be, it is, it, we might see a bug oracle, a sanitizer that will find these, uh, these uh, bugs. So the, the main point here is that when, when we get these sanitizers into the, the fuzzing itself, into fuzzing itself, where developers don't have to 
do anything extra to, to uh, make use of these um, sanitizers. Because we have coverage of all these CNCF projects, they, they will benefit from, from these new developments immediately. And that will have a massive impact. So a single, um, a single sanitizer will be piped out to, to all these uh, CNCF projects uh, without much or any uh, further work. So the, point is, so the point here is that we already have hundreds of fusses now for CNCF projects, but there are a lot of attacks that are not necessarily caught, which actually could get caught even by the corpus that exists in the current fusses. And if you come up now, the next step is if you come up with these bug oracles, all these fusses will be able to find, say, whatever bug your bug oracle may find. I think, I think that's it. We'll leave this uh, conclusion as such. But in short, we've fussed a lot of projects, found a lot of bugs. It works really well. It's not fully automated. As you can see, that there's a lot of bugs to digest. It takes time to write these fusses. So you will often hear fuzzing is security automation, but it, it automates a part. You still have to do a lot of work yourself. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs>